Welcome back and thanks for joining us tonight. Next up, we have a series of presentations by our premier sponsor, Sony. Sony's contribution is significant this year, enab enabling us to offer free programming to all of you. So please support and thank them and all of our other sponsors for the first all virtual Atlanta photojournalism seminar. First up is Amanda Eric, who is a pro support representative of imaging products and solutions for Sony Electronics. Amanda will be discussing Sony's advanced lens technologies and the Sony One mount concept, which brings Sony's most advanced imaging technology together via the E-mount platform, seamlessly connecting full frame and APS-C stills and movies. Amanda? Thank you, Lance, and thank you for the Atlanta Photojournalism Seminar for allowing us to speak this evening. Um, so I am Amanda Eric, as Lance said. My primary role at Sony is I am a pro support representative. Um, a group of my colleagues and myself, we support professional photographers out in the field um, to that are working shooting with Sony currently or that are looking to perhaps um, start begin shooting Sony um, to get familiar with the system and provide any support that they need. Um, one other branch of that is, of course, our pro support membership services, which provide um, with a with a membership of $100 a year, you professional working photographers can get 24 seven um, dedicated phone and email support, expedited repairs um, with free inbound and outbound shipping um, and three free maintenance checks a year. Um, and that's just some of the uh, benefits of the Pro Support Membership Program. Um, but with that, I'd like to kind of start um, speaking to you all about the, um, uh, oh, I think we, hang on, I, I lost my controller. Left, there we go. I seem to not have my slide show up. There we go. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, so as I said before, um, I'm going to be discussing our one mount system and some of our advanced lens technologies here this evening. Um, thanks for getting me going, Greg and Lance. Um, so our one mount system, the benefit here is that you have complete creative um, control and freedom across um, our e-mount imaging platform. So all the way from um, our APS-C imaging cameras all the way up to cameras like the Cinealta Venice, um, it's all one it's a one mount system. So the lenses that you're using with one system can be carried across the line. Um, and utilize um, across the platform. Um, so, you know, Sony designed the E-mount system originally um, when we entered into the market um, back in 2010 and carefully considered balancing both um, quality and size, um, as well as thinking about still and movies um, when designing um, the lenses and the E-mount system. So as I said, you know, you can use an APS-C lens on a APS-C body. You can also use it on a full frame body. You can use a full frame lens on an APS-C body um, or a full frame body um, as well. So um, in complete intermixing of the, um, the lenses, whether APS designed for APS-C or full frame, um, they're completely compatible um, across the line. And again, as I mentioned before, that goes all the way up to the professional camcorders um, and cinema cameras like the Venice. Um, so all of the lenses are completely interchangeable. Um, and we have quite an impressive lineup, you know, currently out on the market in terms of the alpha lenses that are out there and are available. Um, and I'm going to try and give you an overview um, and explain some of the technologies and some of the different sort of naming mechanisms that Sony uses. These are questions that I get a lot when I'm out in the field, um, typically interacting with people at a table and they have a lot of questions. So um, 
one of the things that comes up often is Sony's different sort of categories, categorizations of lenses um, and how we kind of define the different lenses. So you might see different sort of names out there like Zeiss or G or G Master. And um, people want to really understand the differences between those different types of lenses and how and understand how we kind of categorize them. So um, the first thing that and this comes up typically a lot with um, the Zeiss lenses, for example, um, Zeiss lenses within the Sony line are jointly developed by Zeiss and Sony. So we're utilizing some Zeiss technologies, but these lenses are in fact made and manufactured by Sony. Um, <clears throat> so it's a fusion of Sony's technology and also um, Zeiss's high quality standards. Um, they typically display excellent resolution and contrast. And then the G series um, are, are gold standard lenses that are out there on the market. These are really developed in-house by Sony um, entirely. Um, this is the, the G series line is actually a legacy that's been passed down from Minolta, which is where our roots are um, in terms of the lens technology. Um, and these are these are new original design standards, but we're also building on some of the um, uh, innovative uh, technologies that Sony's um, uh, been developing along the way. So they typically display excellent resolution and beautiful bokeh as well. And then the G Master lenses, which is sort of the creme de la creme of our line. Um, these are, of course, developed by Sony as well. Um, they are, are, you know, most innovative technologies are typically put in the newest G Master lenses, and they're designed to resolve um, tomorrow lens, tomorrow's lenses today. Um, <clears throat> they have extremely high resolution and are designed to um, resolve for future cameras. So they're, um, these lenses typically display the, the highest resolution, but also the most spectacular bokeh that, is, that um, can be um, achieved. <clears throat> Currently, there are 11 G Master lenses in our lineup. Um, we go all the way from 12 millimeters all the way up to 600 millimeters now with our G Master lenses. And as I said before, these are typically are the creme de la creme. Um, they have the most innovative, newest technologies incorporated into these. And then I, you know, discussed the G Master. Um, I'm sorry, the the G series lenses as well. Again, also all the way from 12 millimeters up to 600. So a wide variety of focal ranges with both G Master and G series lenses. <clears throat> These include some of our, um, our PZ lenses, oh, whoops. Some of, the, some of our PZ lenses as well that have our smooth optics technology that's you know, fantastic for shooting um, video. Um, they minimize things like focus breathing, uh, focus shift, axial shift, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, as I get a little further into things. And then of course, um, our Zeiss lenses, which I had mentioned um, in the beginning, um, this, these, you know, there's some beautiful primes in this line. Some of my favorites, um, like the 51.4, um, and also, you know, there's what I love about the Zeiss lenses is that there's, um, you know, there's kind of a range as well. So you can look and there's a 35 2.8, which is very compact. So if you're doing, if you're wanting to keep your your system small and light, you know, there's an option there as well as the 35.14, which is a gorgeous lens as well. Um, and the same thing is true with 50. One of the first lenses that we announced um, with our full frame mirrorless, uh, our first full frame mirrorless camera, the A7 and the A7R was the 5518 Zeiss, which is an incredible lens, very compact, um, just stunning contrast and beauty. And, um, and I, I just love how compact it is. You know, one of my colleagues always says that every lens has a soul. And I, I, I love to kind of borrow that because it's really true. You know, I, 
I have a hard time sometimes choosing, even though you know there's not much of a focal difference between our Zeiss 5014 and the um, 55. You know, sometimes that 55 is just it's so it's so nice and small and light and compact. It's nice to to be able to choose that and go with that. Um, but what's nice about the range of um, the Sony, you know, lenses going from G Master to G to um, Zeiss is there's just there's there's something there for everyone. And then of course um, we have 26 additional lenses, including um, teleconverters that can be used. Um, so there are, uh, to extend some of our um, telephoto lenses, like the um, 70 to 200 G Master, 100 to 400 G Master, or um, even the 2 to 600 G series lens. Those can be added on um, <clears throat> to extend the focal length. And again, I'll talk a little bit more as we get further into the presentation about that. But um, there's, of course, a wide variety of lenses as well. Um, um, standard Sony lenses, you know, for someone who's getting started, there are some great lenses in um, the lines that aren't necessarily even designated with G or G Master, um, but some um, lovely lenses there. The 3518 in particular, you know, I, I just love. So there's really something there for everyone. Um, so a truly versatile line, 57 um, E-mount lenses total, um, you know, 37 full frame E-mount lenses, 20 um, APS-C E-mount lenses to choose from. So a lot of diversity, the sky is really the limit. Um, and again, all one mount, all um, perfectly capable of functioning throughout the ecosystem, each, each one of those lenses. Um, but you will notice that there are, um, <clears throat> you know, there are some full frame E-mount lenses, there are some um, APS-C lenses. Now, as I said, you can use these interchangeably um, uh, across the board. Um, on all of the camera camera bodies, it's just, just important to realize that you know if you're using a, um, a APS-C lens on a full frame camera, um, the resolution is going to get um, reduced to one point by one point five times. So if I were to put an APS-C lens on an A7R Mark IV, it would drop down from sixty megapixels to around forty, for example. Um, we're all pretty you know used to this you know thinking about the APS-C, those formats that have typically have the one five crop, for example. So we're, we're, we're pretty used to that and understanding that, for example, if I take a, you know, um, full frame E-mount lens and put it on a APS-C camera, um, the focal length is essentially multiplied by 1.5. So if you're shooting a, you know, 35 millimeter essentially becomes a more like a 50 in the range of a 50. <clears throat> But the one thing that is important is when you're looking at the lenses, you know, sometimes you're researching and you're you're not sure which lens is which. We do designate our lenses. So if you're um, if a lens is designated as FE, that means full frame E mount. E, um, which is the simple E designation, that means APS-C. <clears throat> so that's kind of how to tell the difference there. Um, <clears throat> some other some of the other sort of naming. Um, uh, factors within Sony is we have, um, <clears throat> uh, as I said, you know, E mount and FE mount, but sometimes you might see a lens, for example, that has it's the same focal length. So there may be two. The best example here um, is when I have up is the um, 35 millimeter f1.8. There's actually an APS-C version of this lens and a full frame version of this lens. So that's typically designated with an F um, at the end of uh, the name, designating that it is in fact a full frame lens. <clears throat> and then we also have some A mount lenses. You'll see these designated if you're looking at the name of the lens. Um, all the E mount lenses are designated with SEL. Um, a mount lenses are designated with SAL at the beginning of the name. So Sony E mount lens or Sony A mount lens. Um, and the A mount lenses are um, from the middle to legacy of the uh, and the um, uh, translucent mirror cameras. Um, and those, of course, can be adapted to the E mount cameras as well. You would simply need an LA um, EA adapter in order to adapt those 
cannot adapt, adapt the E mount lenses to the A mount, the older A mount system. <clears throat> so, and then optical OSS, that's optical steady shot. Um, that simply means that um, there's image stabilization built into the lens itself. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with the fact that Sony does have um, image um, stabilization built into some of the bodies of our camera as well. And this, um, this in-body stabilization actually works in tandem with the um, lens stabilization. So the lens would, put, um, the optical stabilization in the lens itself would handle the pitch and yaw and the, um, the uh, sensor, um, which um, is the in-body stabilization would handle the um, XY shift or um, it's called shift and roll. And so here's just one example. We're gonna take an example of a lens. Um, so let's um, say the 70 to 200 F4, you've noticed that your friend's been getting, you know, really nice, um, portraits with this lens. And so you want to make sure that you're going out and, um, you know, finding the right lens. Um, so uh, the Sony name FE starts, you know, that's full frame um, or APS-C. So we know this is a full frame E-mount lens because it's designated with FE. Um, and then we have um, the focal length, the aperture, um, you know, it designates, is it a premium lens, like a Zeiss or a G or a G Master? Um, and does it have um, stabilization? Yes, it does, because it's labeled with the OSS. And so um, that's how you might see it online at a manufacturer. And then the um, our actual name, Sony um, E-mount lens, it's SEL for Sony E-mount lens, 70 to 200. G, and that's kind of the naming mechanism for that lens. And so let's take another example, the Zeiss um, 1.4, 35mm 1.4 Zeiss. Um, so we have here, you know, we see that it's got the um, Zeiss lens technology, um, the SAG and, and the T-Star lens coatings. So we know that's just Zeiss lens technology. It's talking about the structure of the um, lens and the coatings that are on it. And then we know that it's full frame E-mount. Um, the focal length is uh, uh, 35 millimeters and you know f1.4, so that we know that's the um, aperture. And then we know it's a premium lens because it's labeled ZA for um, Zeiss there as well. And so, you know, the Sony name naming mechanism is Sony E-mount lens 35 F 1.4 Zeiss. And so that helps identify, um, identify the lens. So now that we're through kind of some of the, um, you know, nuts and bolts of distinguishing um, the lenses for yourself, um, you can also see, I, I, I want to also talk about Sony as um, an optics company, because I think that that's something that isn't always really recognized, you know. Um, we've really come into our own in terms of um, the design and, um, you know, the performance and, you know, the be overall, like, beauty of these lenses. Um, you know, and one of the benefits that we have is that we develop all of our lenses in-house. That is, that means um, the actuators, the focusing motors um, for autofocus control, um, the optics, um, you know, uh, for the lens, and the um, all of the mechanisms and the chassis um, of the lenses. They're all developed in-house, and that's a big advantage for us in terms of developing uh, newer lens um, technology and, you know, making thing, making sure that things are working seamlessly together. So um, I'd like to, you know, kind of talk about some of the examples of some of these technologies. And I can't do that without sort of, um, you know, discussing specifically some of the G Master technologies. And just because I talk about a technology being, you know, having been like related to G Master, it doesn't mean that some of these you won't see in other lenses that aren't G Master. Um, 
But one of the things that really distinguishes G, Ma G Master from the other lenses in the line um, is that these lenses, when um, Sony came out with this original concept, um, it was tomorrow lenses today. And that was that these lenses had to meet very specific criteria um, in terms of ability to be able to um, resolve at high resolutions. Um, we didn't want to just, Sony didn't want to just look at, you know, being able to resolve for, you know, 24 megapixels or 42 megapixels. They wanted to really think about the um, camera technologies that were going to be coming out in the future. And kind of the two pillars of this were, you know, the, ult the lens um, in terms of the ultimate in resolution, but also producing beautiful bokeh as well. <clears throat> um, so one of the specific criteria for um, G Master is that they are required to um, resolve at um, 50 line pairs per millimeter, um, which the, the way I typically explain this to people is it's kind of like a, you know, an eye chart, you know, so, you know, you go into the, to the eye doctor and you're looking at um, the different letters and as it, as they get smaller and smaller, especially when you're, you know, starting to get a little older, like I am, it gets harder and harder. Things start to kind of blur together and it gets harder to distinguish certain letters like, you know, F and B get hard to distinguish between each other. Um, but simply all this means is that there are these um, very detailed little charts with horizontal and vertical lines. And they're looking that, the, you know, the lens is capable of resolving and distinguishing between those line pairs um, where they wait, where they stop and begin and end. Um, so, so Think of it like that. It's you know these these lenses are be able able to resolve um, uh, much greater detail and see much greater detail, and that gets really important when you start to get into more advanced camera technology technologies with cameras that are able to you know have greater pixel resolution because they can see finer and finer details. So you need a lens that can really match up to that capability. And, and that's why you see things like, you know, I put some, a camera like the A7R Mark IV in someone's hand with a um, 135G Master and people are blown away at the fine details, you know, that you can see of like an eyelash um, on a model and just how like detail, how much detail um, we can find in, in patterns and things. And so that's just one of the pillars of um, G Master. Um, and then the other is also being able to um, not only resolve that fine detail, but also um, render that fine detail and preserve beautiful bokeh. So, um, <clears throat> you know, when we're talking about like the history of Sony Optics and Sony really being an optics company, um, one of um, one of the other things that's you know very important um, is these. Um, you'll look at you know some of these different G Master lenses that have been announced, and one of the other important things that you see are these extreme um, aspherical lenses, the one the ones that are designated with XA, and these um, are capable of. Um, <clears throat> there's very when in the making and manufacturing of these lenses, there's very high surface. Um, precision um, down to uh, 0.01 microns um, uh, in terms of the surface precision and the manufacture of these lenses. So we have, you know, with these extreme aspherical lenses, not only, you know, uh, high resolution, but also um, uh, gorgeous bokeh as well. <clears throat> Um, so just taking, for example, you can see here we have, you know, the, um, this particular is an, um, you know, exploded view of the 16 to 35 G Master lens. Um, and we can see that it's got several, um, X, a couple different XA elements, um, you know, and a spherical elements to, you know, um, cut down on, uh, uh, chromatic aberrations, um, <clears throat> but these are just some of the technologies that are, you know, helping to achieve not just, um, you know, 
superior resolution um, at the um, you know middle like the center area of the lens but also out at the corners um, as well so even you know on the the wider end you know throughout the focal range um, <clears throat> you know, the center, but also out of the, the edges of the frame, we're still like with, with these technologies being able to um, maintain fine detail um, throughout the range of the lens. And then thinking about things, um, <clears throat> you know, it, you know, I was talking about the, the bokeh and what I was talking about when I'm meaning that is, you can see the resulting bokeh from, you know, a lens surface without that position that I was talking about, you start to see things like these um, onion rings um, in the areas, um, you know, of highlights, like where you see the bokeh, you start to see these rings and it's just, it's not as attractive as like the smooth, really buttery bokeh that you can see and achieve with the, with the G Master. Things that also influence this, you know, looking at the lenses aperture blades, um, you know, how many aperture blades, is it a circu um, circular aperture? This also enhances the beauty of the bokeh um, in G's Master, for example. Just some examples of some of the different G Master lenses, like the um, uh, 24 to 70 2.8. This is the 24 um, to 70 2.8 G Master and the uh, 85 uh, 1.4 G Master as well. And then just kind of highlighting some of the other unique um, Sony um, uh, lenses that are out there. One of the other ones I just wanted to mention in the G Master line is the um, 100 STF lens, um, the smooth transition focus. And, you know, this is some of the other, you know, kind of interesting um, technologies that Sony is incorporating, in, in, incorporating into different lenses. And what this lens has is it's an apodization filter, um, which essentially um, it uh, collects light um, differently at the periphery because there's essentially a, what's like a neutral density filter that creates a diffusing effect. And this um, allows for really, um, you know, a buttery look to the bokeh. So typical lenses you might see both, and I should say uh, buttery look to the both bokeh, both at the front and the um, back of the frame. Um, and so, you know, you look at typical lenses, you start to see like a cat eye effect and the um, apodization filter um, from the 100 STF lens um, really um, cuts that out. And you can see what a, what a unique look you can kind of get um, with a lens like this utilizing this technology. One other uh, point I'd like to bring out is the control and the reliability of um, the uh, th that we build into the to the lenses as well. We have, you know, focus hold button that is user assignable, an aperture ring. Um, you can switch from clicks or um, smooth settings. So the um, so that's ideal for video control. We're really thinking, Sony's really thinking about every user and every application for every lens. Um, so you can have the, with the smooth setting, it makes, it doesn't make any noise. But if the still shooter wants to feel those clicks when they're turning the aperture ring, they can. So it's sort of the ultimate um, in control. And then I think one of the biggest points um, about um, sort of the, the history and the innovations that Sony is has made in terms of lenses is focusing motors themselves and are the actuators that Sony has designed and been building have we've really seen them progress from these um, you know um, more rotary style um, motors um, which you know there's a lot of friction there um, so it makes it, you know, a, a lot slower and oftentimes noisier, more mechanical parts. Um, Sony's really moved to these linear style actuators that, um, you know, are moved by, um, uh, they're electromagnetically moved. Um, so it allows for more precise 
um, quieter, um, um, focusing. And this is really important when you have lens like an A9 Mark II, A9, that can shoot at 20 frames per second, that can shoot at 20 frames per second because the focusing system has to be able to keep up. So the precise stopping, um, the higher thrust and efficiency of these XD linear uh, motors that Sony's been designing are really key in terms of, you know, progressing forward um, and, you know, staying on, you know, on the cusp of the, what the cameras are capable of doing. You really need a, a focusing motor that can keep up with them. So we've seen in the G Master line itself, we've seen this transition from um, dire direct drive, supersonic wave mood motors to now we're seeing these um, super XA um, extreme, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> uh, extreme XD, extreme dynamic um, uh, focusing motors. But yeah, really from moving from these rotary style, um, style motors to more linear type of motion um, and moving and driving autofocus, it makes a huge um, difference. Um, as I said, less mechanical errors, less friction. Um, it's a less complicated structure, more simple structure um, that's allowing us to, again, stop and start um, more precisely um, and uh, drive autofocus more quickly. You know, it's contactless, frictionless. Um, it's the way I kind of explain it to people when I don't have visual aids is it's kind of the difference of if you were going to try and get up to the top of the Eiffel Tower, are you going to take a circular staircase or are you going to take a um, elevator straight to the top? And one way is a lot more efficient. <laughs> um, so, um, that's, you know, you can see that linear actual um, linear actuator motor, how just fast and precise it can be. And this, I think, is kind of a great example showing uh, the ring drive motor um, versus the linear motor. Um, <clears throat> the precision and speed at which the linear motor is capable of focusing um, is so pre precise. I was so impressed with this example when I first saw it, one, because I didn't even know that birds of prey could blink but um you know you can really see the difference in being able to drive autofocus this way and the speed and form and performance at which they can really um maintain and you know for example our 16 to 55 2.8 lens has um one of these uh oops did i skip forward sorry has one of these extreme dynamic motors. So it's like I mentioned, a lot of, even though, you know, that was initially developed for a G Master um, application, we see this, um, you know, in other lenses as well. You know, some of the smooth motion optics, you know, um, that were developed originally for some of the um, PZ lenses for video um, that, you know, cut down on focus breathing um, we see those in, for example, the 24 to 105 that I just showed as well. Um, so a closer look, we have a um, 135, um, just some of the, um, this is one of my favorite lenses. It's gorgeous, um, such, you know, high level of detail and just um, how good it is, um, you know, whether focusing close or far away, this is all things um, that um, you know, some of the G Master technology comes into play. You know, from the coatings like the Nano AR coatings and so on, and then also it has two um, it's fl floating elements and also um, uh, uh, linear focusing motors as well. So extreme, extremely fast and precise focusing, um, beautiful bokeh beautiful resolution, just all of the G Master technologies coming together in this one um, in this one lens. And that's just one example. It just happens to be one of my favorite. I wish I could talk about all the lenses, but I'm short time crunch here. So um, just a few. And you can see here, even out at the corners, you know, really um, fine detail, um, uh, even out at the edges of the frame. <clears throat> 
you know, most lenses are, you know, you know, 20 or 30 line pairs per millimeter. And G Master, like I said, is, you know, they're looking at 50 line pairs per millimeter. So um, just um, extremely beautiful bokeh, um, gorgeous resolution, and um, <clears throat> extremely fast in focusing. And just kind of, you know, again, the range of G Master, all the way from 12 to 600 millimeters, um, both in G Master and the G series. Just kind of a few photo examples here um, from the different, um, some of the different line lenses, you know, 12 to 600 millimeters, as I said. And then, of course, you know, the uh, teleconverters, um, which can be used on a number of uh, the lenses, 70 to 200, 2.8 G Master, 100 to 400, um, even the 2 to 600 G, and of course the, um, the 400 millimeter and the 600 millimeter G Masters. But again, just a full range um, and variety um, within the G Master lineup, um, <clears throat> as well as the G series. And of course, the Zeiss, and I mentioned there's a host of other Sony um, lenses as well. Um, <clears throat> in addition, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to um, just add in that if anyone is interested in learning more, um, I'm happy to either work with you myself um, or put you in touch with one of your local representatives um, if you're interested in learning more about Sony. My information's down there below. Again, Amanda Eric. Thank you, Amanda, for explaining yeah. the one mount concept. Uh, again, uh, we are so grateful to Sony for their significant support of the Atlanta Photojournalism Seminar this year. Next up is our very own Sony Artisan of Imagery. Patrick Murphy Racy. Patrick is the contest chair for the seminar. I hope you've had a chance to watch some contest judging, which we've been showing every night this week. Patrick will be giving a two-part talk. In part one, Sony advantages in practice, sports, and video. Patrick will discuss the advantages of photographing sports with the Sony A9 Mark II. Patrick will also discuss his personal experiences capturing Im images blackout free at 20 frames per second by using Sony's sophisticated autofocus tracking system. In part two, the Sony advantage for video capture using the A7S Mark III and the FX9, Patrick will focus on a range of features that make the system both nimble and versatile. At the end of both of Patrick's sessions, uh, we will come back to Patrick and Amanda to answer any of your Sony questions. Patrick? Hey, it's great to be with you guys. Um, I'm changing hats now. I don't have a hat. I don't have actually have hair either, so not to worry. But um, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of introduce uh, in my own viewfinder what it's like to shoot sports with the A9 II. Um, it is an otherworldly experience, to put, put it lightly. And uh, one of the great advantages of a mirrorless camera is that you can actually plug in uh, a recorder, a video recorder to the output of the HDMI out and you can actually uh, see what I see when I shoot. And so uh, the other day I went over to a local tennis club and I did some things and, and I basically built a video that will kind of help to show you what I see when I'm shooting. And so we're gonna go right to that now. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start this video and start rolling uh, so you can kind of see what, what I'm up to. So this is Fenner AF. This is how most sports photographers shoot with a DSLR, or at least they used to. Um, you basically have to follow the, the subject um, and keep them in the middle of the frame. If you get off the subject, you're gonna be on the background. Uh, so it's easy to miss during like peak action. What you have to do when you shoot with center all the time is you have to go back in in post-production and you have to crop all the images. And to make it look like you actually know how to, you know, frame a picture. Um, and so this has been happening forever. And so center autofocus robs you of composing on the fly. And it keeps you from shooting tightly, as tight as you might. Now, the good thing is with the A9 II and the A9 both, you can crop the bejesus out of these pictures. And you can still get really, really great frames, even when you radically do that. But now what we're going to do is we're going to go into wide area autofocus. 
All Sony cameras uh, since about 2006 have wide area autofocus and center. Now what's happening is you're free. Like the, the, the camera is actually motion sensitive. So it knows where you're, um, it knows exactly what you're looking at. But if you watch closely, you'll see it sometimes picks up the racket. And so you'll lose the face. Uh, but it's an amazing thing because you can kind of do that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to turn on face detection and IAF. And we've set it for human as opposed to animals because Sony does both. So right now when you see the little tiny box, it's the eye. When you see the big box, it's doing face detection when it can't manage. There you go. So there's the large box on the face. Um, and then when you see that, it, the camera's telling you, I've got the face. When it sees the eye, it does the smaller box. Um, and so that's wide, wide area with that. And then when you finally see the big, huge square blinking, it's telling you that it's taking a picture because you'd never know it was because it's totally silent and there's no blackout in the mirror because there's no mirror. There's no mirror blackout at all. So you literally just get to roll through and just shoot and you're completely set free to compose as you want to. Uh, it is really this easy. And I'm sorry for the level in the middle there. I kind of wasn't paying attention. I should have had that off. Notice how it, it picks up focus even in the edges of the frame. It doesn't matter where you put the player. Now what we're going to do is we're going to enter into the future, really. We're going to go into tracking or what, what Sony calls real-time tracking. My favorite is tracking flexible spot medium. This is the sort of icon for real-time tracking or simply tracking. It's the square with a line on either side of it. When you are seeing that, it is telling you that it's, it's, it's all over everything. The entire frame is yours. It's doing motion sensitivity. It's figuring out distance to your subject. It's doing face detection, IAF. It's also paying attention to color and pattern. So if you're shooting a football player, for instance, and he's number 87 and there's a guy next to him, you know, whatever, it actually sees the number. It, it looks at body type. It, it can see the difference between the type of face mask that a qu quarterback wears and a lineman. It's unreal uh, to be able to shoot with this. All the way up in the corners, you could do this, and it just rocks. And by the way, you can actually acquire a leg of a person or a shoe or an arm, and it will automatically go to the face. Um, so all you got to do, and here's just examples of how the pictures are sharp and they're IAF sharp, so they're eye sharp. Um, it's just a pretty otherworldly experience to be able to do this. What I've done now is I've slowed the video down so you can actually see it working. And when, every time it takes a picture, it's going to give the big, huge blue box to show you that it was working. Um, and then you can kind of see how tracking is working. When it can't achieve track, tracking, it goes back to face detect and IAF. And if it can't do any of now this is through the net. Now, this is one of the most cool things about shooting sports with Sony, especially when you go to do tennis or uh, volleyball or soccer when you're trying to shoot somebody on a goal. Um, it literally sees right through the net. So these are, this is the loose frame, the tight frame. Um, it's just awesome. I mean, it's so much fun to go and shoot games like this. It just is unbelievable. So what I've done here is I've slowed down the clip so you can see what the real-time tracking icon is doing and when. Because you really can't see it when you're shooting. It's so fast, you can't even, you can't even get there. Uh, it is truly a remarkable, um, experience and it's an experience i love and it's really hard to explain it to people um i walk out on the field and shoot like a football game or something and people see me with sony and they they just don't exactly know what to think although the kind of the words out now i think but um anyway um that's a pretty cool pretty cool thing so i'm hoping that that video was helpful to you so that you kind of be able to see what I see as I'm shooting. Um, a lot of things that Amanda talked about, like the linear focus as opposed to helicoid focus, the screw focus, it is so unbelievably quick and fast. Um, also, the A9 and the A92 are unique cameras in a lot of different ways, but one of them is that they are doing what's called 60 time per second autofocus uh, adjustments, which means that when you're shooting at 20 frames per second, the camera has enough time to make three separate decisions about where it's going to focus 
in between each frame at the rate of 20 frames a second. No other camera in the planet can do that. Only the A9 and the A9 II. It is just a really unbelievable, the takes you get from games are just phenomenal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the computer now. And uh, what I'm gonna do is show you some images, um, just basically stuff that I've shot and explain what I'm doing um, when I'm kind of going through um, this. And so here's, this is beach volleyball in Chicago. And basically just think about, you know, if you shoot a DSLR still, imagine what would be in focus here. Um, it would probably be on the ball, but because I've got face detection and IAF turned on, even though she's wearing sunglasses, it still can find the eye, it still sees her face, it gives me exactly what I need. These are images you can make time and time again. You can sit there and shoot every time they hit the ball and you can capture images like this. It's so easy for really anyone. Um, it's just really cool. I use these cameras for you know everything I do for sports, for portraits, whatever. Uh, I bolt them up on backboards and you know shoot remotes, whatever. Um, this is actually using autofocus, even though the camera's on the floor. Since all the Sony cameras have a flip out screen, it makes sports photography really easy to do. Like you could just like literally leave the camera on the floor and continue to man manipulate focus and put the tracking where you want on the player you want. Uh, so I tracked this guy in as he was driving in and it just, it just makes it so simple. This is a mid court steel with a 400 millimeter lens. This is a 100 to 400 G master. It's a really cool, lightweight, super nimble, versatile lens. Um, it's a great one for just carrying all day. Um, this is a setup shoot. And, and for this, I've lit him with strobes and he's actually flying through the air towards the net in the dark. So we've turned off all the lights in the arena. So it's like almost completely dark. And even though it was dark, the A9 could still see his eye to focus correctly on his eye. It's just crazy. Um, you know, some, when you shoot somebody like Nadal at the, at the US Open, this guy is explosive. I mean, he's just absolutely, you don't know what he's gonna do. Um, he might start talking to somebody off court, like in the, in the fans. I mean, he, he can, he's just a really great athlete to photograph. And uh, when you go shoot your Nadal, you really, you really wanna have an A9 too, because you just don't know. You wanna make sure you nail it. This is my favorite picture from the Open a couple of years ago. You can actually see the fuzz of the ball being knocked off the ball. Every time he hits the ball, the fuzz flies off. And this is a hard picture to make because there's always these side judges in line, there's ball boys, there's all these people around the court. And it's really difficult to get a clean shot of the US Open logo with a great player like Nadal. This is going up. This is a this is the 4028 with a 2X converter shot from where the snipers are up on the way top of the entire uh, arena. Uh, again, you know, I already showed you tennis, but this is like, you know, this is Roger Federer through the guy's legs he's playing against, through the net at him. And it's just, you can do this all day long. It's completely effortless. This is a great point that he made. He actually came from way the other side of the court all the way over. This was a sure he was going to lose this point and he, he won it. Um, amazing. Um, one of the things people don't talk about a lot about the A9 and A9 II is the high shutter speeds that are possible. You can actually shoot up to one thirty-two thousandth of a second. Um, this is actually shot at one sixteen thousandth of a second at 1.8. This is a 55 millimeter lens. This sort of the oh crap camera you keep around your neck at football games for a play like this. And I have literally 11 frames of the ball in the air coming to his hands, 11 frames. So when you can harness the power of 20 frames a second and then you know, put it with 60 time per second autofocus adjustments, the, the ending result is like, there's, you just don't leave a crumb in the ground. It's just so much fun. Again, like I love to shoot tight. This is a 4028 with a 1.4 converter. I do that a lot. Uh, this kind of nice frame, just the light, and it's a, it's a face mask and a reception all at once. Um, the part that I'd really like you to see is this image is has been cropped a little bit, but it has literally not been adjusted anyway. This is straight out of the camera. And a lot of people make a big deal about Sony's low light ability in all their cameras, and they are awesome in low light. 
But the same exact characteristics that make these cameras great in low light make them great in bad light, harsh light. This is like a noon start. And you can still see tonality all over the place on the players' faces in the helmets, even though they're, you know, it's so dark and stuff. Um, so I love, there's still highlight in the top of the Tennessee helmet easily. IF really works even in traffic. Um, so this guy had run all the way behind number 64 and number uh, 85. So he had come from the far right of the frame all the way to the left. The camera was actually tracking him when it couldn't see him. It could actually see his legs and his feet, and so it kept going. So images like this are really pretty easy to get. The IAF is amazing, and in particular on the A92, the IAF is able to pierce inside of face masks um, a, a great deal of time. I'm not going to say it does it all the time, but typically I see razor sharp eyes with huge long lenses. This is 600 F4 wide open. This guy's busting right down the sideline right at me. Um, and uh, it's just neat to see the technology working in your hands. I just put this in because I think it's hilarious. Um, it's really easy to get these fingertip touches on quarterbacks releases because when you're, again, when you're shooting at 20 frames a second, you have so many more frames to choose from but even more so when you go to single frame, when you want this frame, when you want this, this picture with one or two fingertips on the ball, you can actually, you have a, a prayer of getting it uh, pretty consistently in a game, uh, which is really cool. Um, just some typical action. This kind of neat frame, uh, this is just straight out of the camera. It's, I've not, I would obviously lighten it and I would do highlight recovery on the helmet and stuff like that. But what I want you to do is pay attention to the ball and to the, the, um, the playlist on his arm. So here's a blow up of that. And on the gold side, it says Tiger, Ruby, Casino, Choke, Yogi. I can read almost all the orange and, and most of the red ones. Um, so one of the things that's so great with having a, a sports camera that has 24 megapixels is you can crop like crazy and still get things out of it. This is a attack on goal. This resulted in a score, Red Bull. Uh, out of New Jersey, and um, this is like the guy's in the air, going to kick the ball, and uh, he does score. And I'm, I'm. This is really through two nets because you're you're looking through the back of the net and the side of the net at the same time, uh, and the focus is just ice cold. Um, I ask, you know, when you're doing tracking autofocus, um, it's really neat when you look at coaches or a, a throw-in picture like this. It's going to always pick the eye that's closest to the camera. So sometimes it'll be the left eye, sometimes the right, but it's completely effortless and thoughtless. I don't need to think about this in order to accomplish it every single time. It's really great. Again, the moments that you can get it at 20 frames a second with uh, this incredibly fast focus, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. This little series in here, this is not a great series of like, it's not great action, but it illustrates, I think, what I typically see. So I'm tracking on the guy in yellow right now. And as he goes behind the guy in purple, I'm following back there. Even at this point where you can barely see him, it's still not only got him in focus, but it's eye sharp as he emerges. And by the way, the autofocus with tracking works when eyes are closed. So you don't even have to have your eyes open. Even when the hand is in front of the face, it continues to track this player. Um, this is just astounding. You know, for a guy that used to shoot, you know, Triax and Acupine in the 80s, this is a whole other ball game. Um, so it's just really fun. This is the 135. Amanda was bragging about it. I absolutely adore this lens. It's my favorite lens. Um, I think the 24, the 135, and the 4028 are probably my top three. Um, lenses, but this this guy is literally this is a lit thing. It's for a billboard I shot for this university, and this guy is flying through the air and he's jumping into a uh, a high jump pad that's in the end zone. Um, and so the the 135 is actually tracking him in flight and it's keeping his eyes sharp inside the helmet. This is full frame. This is a two three. This is uncropped. I mean, it just it just doesn't get any better than that, man. Portraits are a breeze. Uh, shooting portraits is so easy. All you do is hit some part of the body of the person that you're shooting 
and the camera picks up the rest. It'll automatically find the face and the eyes and go for eyes sharp every time. Um, I love shooting high speed sync portraits outdoors with athletes using, I almost never look through the camera. I've usually got it down at least waist level. Sometimes it's on the ground looking up like this. And I've done entire portrait shoots without ever looking through the camera because I don't need to. This is kind of a cool little fun shoot I did in Las Vegas uh, at a show a couple of years ago. And it just illustrates how easy and how effective eye autofocus is. This guy is jumping up and down on trampoline in the parking lot of the convention center. And these images are, you know, I lit, I lit him up with uh, a bunch of LEDs so we could have a bunch of people out there shooting at once. But it's just so beautiful to, I mean, this picture is easy to redo. It's an easy picture to make as long as you have Sony's autofocus system. Uh, just like with nets, sand traps, when, when the golfs are coming out of sand, uh, it, the sand, if you've, got, if you've got an older camera that doesn't have tracking, um, you can just turn on face detection and IAF, and it will do this every time, um, every single time. So I can't tell you how many times when I used to shoot DSLRs, how I have like perfectly focused sand or perfectly focused, like, you know, somebody behind a speedboat skiing and I'd have the water droplets in focus and not the person. So it's so great to be able to just book through here. Um, this is a 16,000 ISO um, on the A92 when it just had just come out. Um, you can see how sharp it is on that eye. I mean, his eye is tack sharp. The, the again tracking is seeing through the helmet into the you know beyond the face mask to the eye. I, I have no idea how they accomplish that, but it I have come to rely upon it. This is another. This is a twenty thousand ISO. This is kind of near the end zone, and uh, I think that one hurt. <laughs> um, I just wanted to throw this out there just for you know people that are recording and stuff. This is my Instagram and my YouTube channel. I do a lot of content um, on Sony cameras and lenses and, and other things too. So you're welcome to find me anytime there. Um, I always like to sort of segue. So at this point, we're going to move away from sports photography into um, the more video centric side of, of the Sony system. Uh, and so one of the things I like to talk about is vers versatility. This is not shot with an A92. Um, this is actually shot with the A7S III. Um, when I got mine from FedEx and it finally came after waiting so long, um, I went straight to a ball game and shot this picture. Uh, here's a cropped version of it, uh, a little tighter. This is a super sharp frame. I shot this with a 600 F4 at a night game in high school. Um, this is a 40,000 ISO. And there's just, I did not do any um, noise reduction whatsoever on this frame. This is exactly what it came out of the camera. Um, in fact, it's a little underexposed to my, to my liking. But anyway, it's just so cool to be able to use these tools uh, and have such an advantage. Um, so um, what we're going to do is, um, is next is uh, uh, I'm going to kind of retool this here a little bit. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the A7S in terms of technical gobbledygook. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to actually show you some gear. And um, so you can kind of see, you know, what I'm talking about. So this is the, um, the, A the A7S III is a truly, truly radically unique camera. Um, in part of the story of why, why the A7S III has so many people in video excited is the the bit depth um, the the what is possible with the A7S III in terms of color is a really truly remarkable thing. So this camera not only can shoot in the dark, um, but it can keep it can actually keep skin it can hold skin tones accurate at unbelievably low ISOs. Um, so if you're shooting something and you're, you know, if you're just like um, totally in the dark, you can shoot stories, you can shoot interviews in between streetlights in, in a small town where there's not that many streetlights. 
Um, most cameras up until the A7S III have 8-bit uh, eight, eight depth. And this means that um, the three channels RGB produce 256 different colors per channel. 10-bit um, depth offers uh, over a thousand shades of color for each channel. And so the difference between um, 8-bit depth cameras and 10-bit is radical. And you really see this, uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where, where I really see this is when I come into an editor. Um, typically in the last few years, you know, when you're editing video as a still photographer coming into video, it can be extremely frustrating to um, be used to be able to tone images and, and stills. It's so easy and there's lots of information, but when you go to the video part, you can't really do as much as you could before with stills. And when you go and you make the transition to 10 bit depth color, 10 bit color, all of a sudden you get all a lot of that information back and it really changes everything. And so the good news about the A7S III is it's awesome and I'm gonna use it all the time. The kind of the bad news for me is that I don't think I'm ever gonna to wanna to go back and shoot an 8 bit depth camera again for video. It's just not, it's kind of a pointless enterprise. And so, um, you know, it kind of probably will involve me buying multiple A7S III's in, in the future, uh, maybe when there's work again after COVID. I don't know. We'll see. But um, anyway, so um, it's really, really cool to be able to do 10-bit color. Um, and I think the A7S III will push the envelope on what's possible in real production, uh, like independent films. This camera is going to be able to be utilized in places where way more expensive cameras and lens sets were used in the past, but this is going to be a better uh, outcome uh, ultimately. And so it's, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. So just a few things about the A7S III and, I'll, and then I'll pull it out, but this camera can shoot 4K um, at 24p, 30p, 60p, and 120 frames per second in 10-bit color. Um, it is also possible to do uh, a 16 bit raw video output into like an Atomos or an aftermarket recorder, like a third party recorder. Um, there is no clip limit on the A7S III. And just as a point, I want to make sure that you understand the A7R4 doesn't have a clip limit. The A92 doesn't have a clip limit. The, even the A6600 does not have a clip limit. So, this is not unique to the A7S III. It's, it's actually kind of coming into a lot of lines. Um, also, there's IAF in video. So the same kind of things that you were able to see in my video of the tennis players is a reality for video now. Um, and, you know, there's, I would tell you that there's a lot of people out there that have been doing video for years and they're focused pulling interviews. And that's just not needed anymore. You just don't need to. Uh, the Sony has an incredibly organic autofocus on eyes. So you can comfortably go into an interview situation and use an 85 G Master lens wide open and close to the person. Even if they're shifting and moving around in their chair, it's still going to work. And, and by the way, the, both of these cameras that I'm using right now are doing IAF. These are both A6600. So these are one four lenses wide open. Um, and so you're actually seeing that in, in play right now, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing that's really neat about the A7S III is it's compatible with this full digital XLR K3M audio unit with the mic. And I'm gonna pull that out in just a minute. Um, and uh, this that mic is, is incredible. Um, a big shout went up when people watched the video launch of the A7S III when they said that it had a full-size HDMI port. I mean, everybody was like, oh, thank God, <laughs> they finally did it. Um, and so we've gone from like this micro thing to this huge full-size HDMI port, which is more robust. It's not gonna fall out. It's not gonna be wiggling around. It's just great. Um, the A7S III has more autofocus points than the A92 which is kind of insane. Uh, there's 759, um, which is just awesome. 15 stops, dynamic range, a low light performance. You saw like a still picture with it, it's incredible. Um, 
and the video, the ISO goes up to 409,600. Now, I've never tried that. I'm sure it's not great looking, but you can get up there over 100,000. It looks amazing. Um, the the eye level viewfinder or the EVF um, has is 9.44 m dot. It's it's like it's basically double the, the resolution that we've ever had in the very best cameras like the A7R4 and the A92. Um, so the the OLED viewfinder, the EVF in the a A7S3 is better than any other camera that I've ever looked through. It's incredible. Um, a really nice welcome thing too was the CF Express Type A card slots. And Sony kind of ingeniously designed them so that you can also use SD cards. So if you don't need to shoot 120 frames a second, you don't need the fast card. You can just use like an old G card or whatever, and it'll work great. Um, and then last thing I want to mention is that the, the weight of the A7S III is 1.35 pounds. So you're, you're picking up something that is uh, incredibly lightweight um, and just super small. And uh, so I'm pulling the camera off a tripod right here. And I'm going to come and bring it in here and be able to show it to you. So this is the A7S III. Um, it is an unbelievably compact, lightweight deal, even with this rig on it, you know. It has the flippy screen that a lot of people ask for, um, which is great because you can also close it with the back. I, when I travel, I close it like that so you don't see the LCD. Um, you know, LCDs can get beat on pretty badly over time. Um, this is the XLR K3M, and I'm going to flip this door open here and bring this in close so you can kind of see uh, all the controls that are present on the side of a $200,000 Sony cinema camera are present here. Um, this has the ability to go full digital uh, with no analog at all. Um, it has the ability to do, um, you know, it's got attenuations. It has all the controls you'd want to have. Um, so when you're shooting run and gun, especially if you're doing news, you can literally ride, you can ride the games as you're going, you can be listening to headphones and, and be shooting and really be all over your audio. Audio is so important to those of us that do production. It, it's, you can't underestimate the power of audio with, with the moving images that you're making. And so XLR K3M is awesome because it, it, it gives you a real microphone. It gives you phantom power that is coming out of the battery in the camera. So you're not having to find, there's no batteries in here, all right? This is all just, you know, uh, solid state. Um, the battery, by the way, is amazing. The Z batteries are incredible. They just go forever. Um, this is one of my favorite lenses to use on a gimbal. Uh, this is a 24 G Master lens. It is, it is like breathtaking. And just like Amanda was saying before, you can just de-click, you just throw a switch, it's on, now the clicks are off. So this 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 will just move completely smoothly without any issue. So if you're going through a doorway or something like that and you're shooting, you can actually ride the aperture through that doorway and and do one clip from inside to outdoor bright sunlight. You can, you can pull it off. Um, but just having it be so lightweight and then with this pro audio option is really cool. So the the A7S III is pretty amazing and I. I haven't really been able to shoot with it that much, but I did do some shooting with it. And I'm going to go ahead and show you a little video that I made uh, because I have never shot in my entire life. I've never been able to shoot at 120 frames a second before. And I wanted to see what that was about. <laughs> and so this is um, two different options. Uh, one was at the tennis place I was at the other day where I shot the stills. And then the other one is um, at uh, uh, up in the Smokies. So here we go. Um, so this is this. So this is so beautiful to be able to see this so slow. This is 25% speed. Um, this is the A7S, my favorite lens, the 135 1.8 G Master. This is 4K and 120p. And I'm using what's called touch focus, which is effectively tracking for video. So all you do is when the camera's idle, you just touch the screen on the back and you tell it, I want that player, and it will ignore everybody but her. And so all this has been shot with um, 
This is just on a little Benro tripod, you know, little video head, not an expensive setup. Uh, the 135 wide open. Um, I did shoot these at um, about 500 of a second shutter speed. So if you really slow it down, you'll see a little chatter because I'm so far above the frame rate. But for me, it's worth it to get the sharp still, the sharp still frames. And this is just uh, me take. I took, took a video monopod and I went up in the Smokies and I turned it upside down. And I was just flying the camera upside down, like the hot shoe was like sometimes an inch above the water. And this is all out of focus. Um, so this is just me kind of maneuvering the camera in and around this leaf and these rocks and this little little creek. Um, you know, just it's uh, it, it's pretty fun uh, to be able to do that. So for me, you know, being able to like go up into the Smokies and do um, these kinds of things, uh, you know, so effortlessly um, with the same camera that I can then take, if I'm going to take that and shoot uh, a wedding with it, no problem. You know, Sony, and I'm sorry, Amanda, her ears are going to burn here in a minute, but, you know, Sony is so good at telling you what their cameras are for. Photographers are the ones that actually use them for what we need and what we want. And, uh, you know, I think that when I shoot weddings in the future, for instance, or if I'm going to do a photojournalism story, I may not need 20 frames a second. I'm going to probably reach for the A7S a lot more than Sony thinks I'm going to. Um, it's just an amazing camera. Um, and it, it also is neat because, you know, Sony's evolving so quickly and so fast. It's just unbelievably how quick they are uh, to adapt and bring new technology and improve. Um, you know, it, it's really cool. And I just, you know, the, the A7S III tells me what the next A9 is going to be like. It tells me what the next A7 IV, you know, or A7, whatever it is, whatever they call it. It shows me what's happening. And I appreciate that very much. So the next thing I want to do is uh, pull out the big dog here, which is the the FX9. This is uh, this is not cheap, um, but it's sort of going. This camera, um, to be quite honest, the FX9 represents everything I don't know about video. But how am I going to figure it out unless I get one and use it and figure it out? So that's what I'm doing. Uh, so the FX9 is a full frame. Um, a full frame camera, it has a lot of the same attributes. The sensor is very similar to what's in the A7S III. It's very good on the light, um, but it has something that's really amazing. It has um, variable ND, but more than just variable ND, it has auto variable ND. This is so freaky the first time you try it. It is, it is truly amazing. So. What you can do is you can set your shutter speed and your gain and your aperture. And then you can go from, in, in, if, you, if you turn on auto ND, you can actually go through a doorway without touching anything. And your depth field's not gonna change because you haven't changed your aperture. Your, your um, frame rate's not gonna change. Your shutter speed's not gonna change and your gain's not gonna change. So, I mean, the gain will change as the neutral intensity adds more or takes out. So basically, the you're doing auto exposure kind of in manual, but it's not going to affect the image quality of what you're shooting. So this is just an incredibly awesome um, way to work. And uh, you know, I'm not a proper ENG person, but I really am interested in doing really serious interview uh, um, segments. I would like. I love lighting. Um, I love to do things. I like to make people look good. And I'm hoping to do more corporate work. And also, I really want to tell some stories. I want to do some things in 2021 um, using this technology. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning more about the FX9. Um, the other thing, Amanda talked a lot about the, the, the one mount system. And the one mount system is, is really cool. And I'm going to kind of show you literally what that's about. So like this is a cinema lens. This lens is designed specifically for doing um, doing video. And, uh, oops, we just lost that there. Sorry. And what I'm going to do is uh, pull this lens off uh, the front of the camera. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put it on 
to the A7S3, which is no big deal. So now the A7S3 has this lens instead of the FX, uh, FX9. So now I'm going to take the 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 2414 G Master lens that was on the A7S3, and I'm just going to plop it right onto the FX9. So now I can kind of run and gun if I want to. Um, there's a lot of things I can do with this. Um, and it's just cool. Now, there's a couple of other things that are that are kind of neat. I'm going to back up here a little bit because I'm too close. But um, on the top of the FX9, there's a hot shoe, just like there's a hot shoe in um, any of the still cameras. Um, so what I can do is I can take this XLR K3M thing off, this microphone deal, and I can put this up into the, the uh, multi-interface shoes, with a call. It's just a hot shoe. And when I put this on there, you might think, well, that's dumb. You already have two microphone ports up there. Like, why would you do this? Um, let me pull this down so you can see it. Sorry, it's hard to manipulate in a small room. So just to kind of show you what I've done, I now have this XLR K3N thing that I showed you right here. Um, so it's on there and like there's a the little door I can pull up. So what happened just now is I just took a very accomplished two-channel, um, built-in two-channel uh, FX9 now this camera is capable of shooting four separate channels of audio and it's all going to go on the same card in the port so like this for a lot of people this is a big deal because if you just have too much going on you have too much audio you know it's, it's awesome so even the um even the arm even the arm itself that is on the other side of the fx9 that has your like record button and your zoom and all that kind of stuff. Even that thing will disconnect and connect onto the A7S3. So I can make this into, I can use the pieces and parts from my FX9 and use it on A7S3. So it's a really, really cool, um, it's just an awesome system. It's so well thought out and, uh, I just appreciate, you know, Sony working so hard to try to like reinvent everything. Um, so anyway, um, I am um, kind of running out of gas here and I, I think it would be a great time to kind of transition into questions. Um, if you have questions about the A92 or shooting sports, if you have questions about really any part of the system, I, have, I own a big chunk of the Sony system. so. Chances are I might have a lens or a camera that you want to ask about. Um, if you want to ask about video, uh, I'm I'm kind of just getting started in video, but I'm really loving it. And uh, and Amanda's here with us as well. So if we could, let's go ahead and bring back um, Lance and uh, Amanda, and let's all get together and sort of field some questions if we could. I do want to ask Amanda, did you have any thoughts uh, listening to Patrick's usage of Sony gear? I was curious about that. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, Patrick always surprises. I hadn't thought about sticking on the, uh, you know, intermixing the uh, um, XLR um, A3M onto the FX9, but that's, you know, <laughs> kind of a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I think as photographers, we all kind of learn from each other sometimes. And, you know, even at Sony, one thing that I would say is that we love feedback. So hearing things like that, yeah. you know, that kind of percolates, starts percolating some other thoughts as to, you know, recommendations I can make to other customers. And, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I learned something, <laughs> I guess. Sure. Uh, hey, cool Patrick, I had a question. Minute. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead and uh, finish, Patrick. Well, I was just going to add to what Amanda said. You know, when she talks about uh, feedback, she's not kidding. I mean, every time there's a, a, a situation where artisans gather, uh, 
they send engineers. And so we, I've had a lot, many, 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 I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours of time over the last uh, five years explaining to engineers what we need or, or thanking them for giving me something I never thought to ask for. Um, but developing the cameras and develop the lens system, um, they've gotten a lot of input from photographers, which is why they're at where they're at. Um, so it's really fun to be working with not just a camera company, but like a family that listens to one another. And that's a big part of why I just love my relationship with Sony and, and really cherish that. Uh, I did want to ask you, Patrick, uh, when you were going through that uh, flexible spot M, what you were kind of calling the, the future, um, is that something that you yeah. have to uh, set with the touch focus on somebody's face when you're doing that? Yeah, well, um, actually, or does it kind of pick up a face on its own? Um, you can hit any part of a body of a human being and it will automatically gravitate to the face. Like you can literally start on a knee if you want to, you, I can hit somebody in the knee with it and whoop, it's going to like go up to the face. And then you're going to see the square with the line on either side of it, which is the tracking icon. And as long as you see that baby on, it's telling you we've got all of it in RAM. We're looking at pattern, color. And remind, also, I want to make, make sure I made, I don't know if I made this clear. If you're shooting two boxers in a ring and one's in red shorts and one's in blue, and you click on the blue guy, it's going to ignore the guy in red, even when they circle around in front of you. So it'll just track. It'll just wait only for that red. Um, if you had identical twins, okay, that were playing right next to each other on the offensive line, one's 87 and one's 88, um, the Sony system actually can tell the difference between the pattern between those numbers. So if you pick 87, it's going to ignore 88. Now, it's going to be tempted because it's an identical twin to go the other way, but um, but it, it's truly a remarkable system. So you just have to, and in, in the video side, you touch focus on the back of the camera. You just touch once and you're done. Uh, and by the way, you could touch once backpedaling down a hallway, shooting a congressman or something like that. And once you touch it, that's it. I mean, it's going to track. It's amazing. I'd like to ask both of you, uh, Amanda and Patrick, and let's, let's start with Amanda um some of your favorite lenses and and amanda you could even address some of the lenses that that people ask you the most about i'm, I'm curious about that <laughs> yeah well so i always this is always i find one of the hardest questions because there are a lot of lenses to love and then the other reason lately i've sort of <laughs> this question is all because i feel like a lot of us all pick the same one <laughs> everyone is really really enamored with that 135 i mean it yeah, is just yeah. i've never shot anything like it it is the sharpest lens just the rendering of the bokeh like i just i i've never shot anything like it i can't speak more highly i mean i just i can't say enough good things about it so that like hands down i think you know, wins out for most people. I guess maybe for some who don't like that focal length as much, it's a little too tight for them. They might feel differently, but even those people, I feel like once they experience it, it's just, it's mind blowing. So that is my favorite. Um, I really love the 514 Zeiss. It's another favorite of mine. I do a, a lot of what I do these days is, you know, portraits of my kids, <laughs> especially like being, you know, home so much. So I tend to migrate towards those. I love the two to 600. Um, I just, the event that I just came off of was um, Breeders' Cup. Um, so, I, you know, that for, you know, shooting horses, it's just so, it's so easy, you know, um, it's, you know, a quarter turn basically from two to 600. It's super, super easy to shoot. And I, I, I initially went in, you know, probably six months ago, you know, my answer would have been, I love the 100 to 400 more, but that lens is really, the two to six has really grown on me lately, um, especially shooting the horses. So that's a, that's a new favorite. Um, and then I really love, the one, the 3514. Um, that's another one of my favorites as well. Um, I just, 
you know, that lens is, you know, super sharp out of the edges and the center. I just, when I'm flipping through images, I just, I, gra I, I gravitate towards images that I've shot with that lens. So that's another favorite. That's three. So I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah. Patrick, what, what about yeah, you? I love prime. I'm a huge prime lover. So for me, it's 24, one, four, 35, one, eight, um, 51, four, same one that Amanda talked about. Um, I have the 85, one, eight, which I really like, and it's really sharp, but I really, I want to, if I'm going to use an 85, I'm going to figure out a way to get that 135 on instead. That's what I do. <laughs> so if you go back to before they made the 135, 1.8, most of my lit portraits were shot with a 85, 1.4. Now they're almost entirely shot with a 135. I just back up because honestly, I just want to look at the pictures afterwards. <laughs> um, and then um, I love the 428 and the 600 F4. They're just incredible, incredible unbelievably beautiful pieces of equipment, tools, whatever. Now, if I'm gonna walk all day, um, a lot of people forget this, but if you do the 14 to 24 F4, the 24 to 105 F4, and the two to 600 F4, you have three lenses that weigh almost nothing, and you're literally going from 12 millimeter to 600 with no weight. So if I'm doing NASCAR, a day NASCAR race, that's what I'm taking because there isn't anything I'm going to wish I had another lens for nothing. It's all there. So I just like the ability to uh, be able to blow things up on screen and post and look at the corners and the edges and everything is just so sharp. Um, but I am partial to the primes. I'm more of a prime shooter these days and uh, it's okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have, do you have one question from uh, Zachariah? Forgive me for probably butchering your name here, but uh, he said, uh, Chu or Chow, uh, your last name. Anything you can say about the A7R4? I mean, I love the A7R4. I So <clears throat> my usual, like if I'm setting, if I'm going with a two camera setup, I use the A7R4 and the A9 Mark II. Um, you know, I've spoken at length already about the 135, but one of the great things about that is I can put the 135 on the A7R Mark IV with, you know, 60 megapixels. I can, um, you know, crop in, you know, I can I basically assign a button um, on the lens, the focus um, hold button, and I can crop into that 1.5 crop and then I kind of have my 135 and you know a little over 200 millimeter as well. Um, so I'll walk around. That's kind of that's actually kind of like a go-to setup for me. So I love that camera. Um, the level of detail you know that you can get out of it, um, and I can even crop in beyond that <laughs> very easily. So um, I, I guess I'd love more specifics about what specifically you want to know about it. But you know, I mean, it's got the real-time autofocus um, tracking as well. So it's a tremendous autofocus system, um, tremendous resolution. It's a wonderful camera. Yeah, and I'm a little partial myself. I own one um, and it does have incredible <laughs> resolution. It's like a medium format camera. First time I, I, I was actually down in the Dominican Republic when I first got to play around with it and uh, mm -hmm just shot one of these street corners that has like a million uh, power power lines going off in every direction. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember I just got back to my hotel room and I blew up the picture and I just could keep blowing it up. I was just blown away by the resolution. I've never seen anything like that for, in a DSLR. Um, we should probably wrap it up time-wise. Um, I know I, one last thing from our President Michael Schwartz uh, asked, does the autofocus setting that uh, Patrick was talking about also work for video? I think you kind of answered that, didn't you? Yeah, I would say yes. In in practice, it does. The, the A9 II uh, was designed for a very, very specific and narrow thing, which is action photography stills. Uh, the sensor was made 
for that purpose specifically. And um, so it, the, the A92 and its ability to autofocus is superior to any video camera that I've, that I've played with. Uh, even though like the, the cameras are so good now, FX9 has phase detect autofocus in it, it's incredible. But it doesn't, it doesn't hold a candle to what the A92 can do in stills. However, the tracking feature is present in FX9. It's present in the, A9, in the A7S III. Um, and it's also present in the A7R IV. Thanks, Amanda and Patrick, for that great rundown of Sony lens technology. And Patrick's practical stills and video shooting experience was invaluable. And another huge thanks to Sony for your support of the Atlanta Photojournalism Seminar. I hope you have cleared out your calendar for tomorrow because Saturday is the day we have worked to bring you all year with some of the most thoughtful, inspiring, and talented minds in the business. Our Saturday speakers will include Leslie Davis, the Minneapolis Star Tribune staff, Carrie Mason, who is incredible, I got a little preview of him. Michael Santiago, Ben Gray, Alyssa Pointer, Carolyn Cole, Victor Blue, Beth Nakamura, and Meredith Kohut. If you missed any of our YouTube live stream sessions this week, they will all be available on our YouTube channel to watch anytime. And if you cannot make it tomorrow, you can buy access to all of the Saturday presentations for $29 through our Vimeo On Demand page but you must order before the end of the day, Saturday. After Saturday, the price goes up to $49. Check out our website for links to Saturday's programming and for links to our Vimeo On Demand page. If you missed last year's programming, that's available through Vimeo On Demand as well. We hope you all join us tomorrow, all day. That's it for tonight. Cheers. Mm.